study 2 Kings 8 today, but before we do, I want to explain the nature of what it is that we're going to be looking at because otherwise it can be a bit confusing. And also because we're going to see the same literary style on and off again throughout the remainder of the book of 2 Kings. But we're also going to be in this chapter for a couple of weeks. Because while it might not seem so in a casual reading, there is a great deal going on that we need to understand. Now while the Old Testament has generally been presented to us in, in chronological sequence, sometimes it's not. And here in 2 Kings 8, it's not. But that doesn't mean that we're reading standalone stories that were just kind of dumped here because there was nowhere else to put them. This is not a situation whereby there is no discernible link or connection to what has come just before or what's going to come just after this chapter. There is a definite meaning and intent to the way this was produced. From a broad view, when it comes to the way that the Old Testament was written, especially in the books that deal with Israel's history, it's not as if only one thing is happening at any given moment. In a nation or even a community, whether large or small, whether ancient or modern, several important things can be going on simultaneously, each having their own complexities, their own reasons for occurring, but also at times these events become linked. Sometimes what seems like an isolated event or, or, or just a local matter has a wider ranging impact than anyone had a right to expect. And sometimes that impact's immediate, at other times it's delayed. Most times it can't be predicted. In secular history, all of these seemingly unrelated events that conspire at times to even change the course of history are thought to be coincidental. But where the Lord is involved, as with Israel or with his church, these events that become somehow linked can be viewed as divine providence. It is the Lord operating behind the scenes, unseen, but in full control. And it might be years, it might be centuries before mankind can suddenly discern what he's been up to all along. Thus, whether for a secular historian or for a writer of the scriptures, the issue becomes how to weave these stories together, all of these several disparate events, and tell a complete and an intelligible story to future generations. In modern times, documentary film directors use a variety of methods to accomplish this. They'll use flashbacks or they'll introduce a character or an expert in a specific study of a uh, field of study who adds more information. Sometimes they'll create a film that actually starts at the end with a conclusion and then steps backward in time in order to create this, this link to show us the strange sequence of events that caused the end result to occur like it did. Historical writers use other techniques. Sometimes entire chapters will be devoted to one specific event, and then another chapter shows what was happening elsewhere at the same time. Then how all the connections occurred. Some writers use timelines, others use appendices, long footnotes, so on. If anyone has ever watched a good documentary on World War II, then you know that issues and conditions and politics that were all critical and internal to specific nations like Japan and Germany and France and Italy, China, the United States, others. It all came together to what began as a war among some European nations into a worldwide conflagration. And each of these nations had different motives and causes that pushed them into it. But to accurately tell the story requires relating what happened within each nation in isolation, then showing what impact that had on another nation, and then this un unexpected domino effect they had elsewhere. We see this in the Book of Kings especially. 
See, because we're dealing with two Israelite kingdoms that existed simultaneously. One called Judah, the other called Israel, which resulted from a breaking apart of a single kingdom under David and then Solomon. And we find that due to long relationships and an extensive history of tensions and battles between the Hebrews and some of their neighboring kingdoms, each with their own political and social, social agendas in mind, that these often collided. Or they came together to cause something important to happen. But knowing the history of what led up to an important event can be equally important as the event itself. So it has to be captured, somehow woven into, this, into a discussion. That's what's happening in 2 Kings chapter 8. The writer or the editor of the book of Kings is putting another few pieces of the historical puzzle into their proper places so that we get a much more complete picture. And has been the case for a few chapters now. The life and the prophetic ministry of Elisha and to a lesser degree Elijah provide the context for the story. Thus after we have read about the siege of Samaria by the kingdom of Aram in chapter 7 and the relief of that siege by means of Jehovah scattering the Aramean army through a supernatural deception, we now have a flashback that provides some needed perspective on the whole thing. So, open your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 8. 2 Kings chapter 8, page 409 if you have a complete Jewish Bible. 2 Kings chapter 8. We'll read it all. Now, Elisha had said to the woman whose son he had restored to life, Move away, you and your household, and stay wherever you can, because Adonai has called for a famine, and it will be on the land for seven years. And the woman acted at once, and did as the man of God, man of God had said. She went with her household and stayed in the land of the Philistines for seven years. And at the end of seven years, the woman returned from the land of the Philistines and sought an audience with the king to claim her house and her land. The king was talking with Gehazi, the servant of the man of God. Tell me, he said, all the great things that Elisha has done. And just as he was telling the king how he had restored a dead person to life, at that very moment, the woman whose son he had restored to life came to the king with her claim for her house and her land. And Gehazi, Gehazi said, my lord king, this is the woman, and this is her son, the one Elisha restored to life. And on being asked by the king, the woman verified it. And at this, the king appointed a special officer and charged him, restore everything that belongs to her, including the income her fields have produced from the day she left then until now. Elisha went to Damasek, Damascus. Ben-Hadad, the king of Aram, was ill, and he was told, the man of God has come here. The king said to Hazael, Take with you a gift and go meet the man of God and consult Adonai through him. Ask if I will recover from this illness. Hazael went to meet him, taking with him a gift that included everything good Damascus had, 40 camel loads. He came, he stood before him and said, Your son Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, has sent me to you. He asks, Will I recover from this illness? And Elisha answered, Go and say to him, You will surely recover, even though Adonai has shown me he'll surely die. Then the man of God fixed his gaze on him for so long that Hazael became embarrassed. And finally Elisha began to cry. And Hazael asked, Why is my Lord crying? And he answered, Because I know the disasters you will bring on the people of Israel. You will set their fortresses on fire. You will kill their young men with the sword. You will dash their little ones to pieces and rip their pregnant women apart. And Hazael said, but, but what is your servant? Nothing but a dog. How could he do anything of such magnitude? And Elisha answered, Adonai has shown me that you will be king over Aram. Then he left Elisha and returned to his master who asked him, what did Elisha say to you? He told me you would surely recover. The next day he took a blanket 
he dipped it in water and spread it on his face so that he died. And Hazael took his place as king. It was when Yoram, the son of Ahav, king of Israel, was in the fifth year of his reign that Yehoram, the son of Yehoshaphat, began his rule over Judah. He was 32 years old when he began to rule, and he ruled eight years in Jerusalem. He lived after the example of the kings of Israel, as did the house of Ahav, because he had married Ahav's daughter. He did what was evil from Adonai's perspective. However, Adonai was unwilling to destroy Judah because of his servant David, inasmuch as he had promised to give him and his children a lamp that would burn forever. And during this time, Edom revolted against Judah and set up its own king. And in response, Yoram crossed to Zaire with all of his chariots. And at night, he and his chariot commanders set out and attacked Edom, who surrounded him. And then the people fled to their tents. Nevertheless, since that day, Edom has remained free of Judah's domination. Libna revolted at the same time. Other activities of Yoram and all of his accomplishments are recorded in the annals of the kings of Judah. Yoram slept with his ancestors. He was buried with his ancestors in the city of David, and Ahaziah, his son, took his place as king. It was in the twelfth year of Yoram, the son of Ahav, king of Israel, that Ahaziah, the son of Yehoram, king of Judah, began his reign. Ahaziah was 22 years old when he began to rule, and he ruled for one year in Jerusalem. His mother's name was uh, Ataliao, the daughter of Omri, king of Israel. He lived after the example of the house of Ahab. He did what was evil from Adonai's perspective, as had the house of Ahab, for he was a son-in-law in the house of Ahab. With Yoram, the son of Ahab, he went to war against Hazael, king of Aram, at Ramot Gilead, and the Aramim wounded Yoram. King Yoram returned to Jezreel to be healed of the wounds which the Aramim had inflicted on him at Ramah while fighting Hazael, king of Aram. Ahaziah, the son of Yehoram, king of Judah, went down to visit Yoram, the son of Ahav, in Jezreel because he was not feeling well. Four chapters ago, we read the story of a Shunammite woman whose loyalty and hospitality to Elisha and whose trust in her Israelite God brought her a degree of righteousness that merited the resurrection of her only child, a son, from the dead. But here we read another piece of the story of which we were unaware. It is that Elisha had also shown her favor by informing her that a famine was coming. And she indeed needed to gather her family, pack up, and leave the area so that they could survive it. <clears throat> he gives her three important pieces of information. First, the famine is coming and it's going to last for seven years. Second, she needs to sojourn elsewhere. Third, this famine is being caused by God. So here, the famine is not merely being allowed by Yehovah, but rather he is directly causing it to happen. Further, the famine is apparently going to affect all of the Holy Land. That is, Ephraim, Israel in the north, Judah in the south. And I'll tell you how I know that in a minute. But in some unfathomable way, it is more or less going to be supernaturally restricted only to Hebrew territory. Verse 1 says the land, the Eretz, will suffer the famine. And it will have little or no effect on the neighboring Gentile kingdoms. Thus the woman is told by Elisha to sojourn wherever she chooses. But the context is that she needs to be a sojourner, meaning a temporary stranger, which also means it has to be a foreign land. Naturally, as it was for the famine in Egypt during Joseph's time, the duration is seven years, indicating that this is God's doing. Since seven is a kind of symbolic heavenly unit of time that has a definite beginning and a definite ending. 
Interestingly, we have heard of this particular famine that Elisha is warning the woman about in an earlier chapter. In 2 Kings 4, verses 35 through 38, we read this. Then he, Elisha, went down and walked around in the house for a while, went back up, stretched himself out on the child again. The child sneezed seven times, then he opened his eyes. Elisha called Gehazi and said, call this Shunammite. So he called her, and when she came in to him, he said, pick up your son. And she entered and fell at his feet and prostrated herself on the floor, and then she picked up her son and went out. Elisha went back to Gilgal at that time. There was a famine in the land. The guild prophets were sitting before him, and he said to his servant, put the big pot on the fire, boil some soup for the prophets. You probably remember this story now. So we know that this famine had begun when Elisha left the village of Shudim after reviving that dead boy. And then he went to the desert community of Gilgal, which is very near to Jericho and to Jerusalem. Not only does this tell us when the seven-year famine had begun, very soon after Elisha had resurrected the woman's young son, but also that the famine extended to the south, on into Judah. Thus we learn that God was punishing not only the northern kingdom, but also the southern, because the king of Judah at that time, at the beginning of the famine, probably Jehoshaphat, had been turning more and more unfaithful towards the Lord. The woman from Shunem decided to go and live in Philistia because it wasn't too far away from where she lived. And the famine wouldn't have any effect here. But according to verse 3, when the woman and her household returned home seven years later, they found it occupied by squatters. And since she was an aristocrat, she was able to get an audience with King Yeram. And when she arrived at his palace, we're a little bit surprised to find none other than Elisha's servant, Gekhazi, in conversation with the king of Israel. Why would he be there? First, it must be that although the Bible temporary, uh, rather typically refers to him as a servant, it also typically refers to a king's royal court as servants, even though they are really high-level cabinet members. So at the least, Gehazi was recognized as having a lofty status within the northern kingdom. He was by no means some lowly servant. But the rabbis are further puzzled by his presence, because the sequence of the book of Kings seems to be clear that by now, Gehazi had been divinely afflicted with Zerat, which wouldn't have permitted him inside the city walls, let alone to be inside the king's palace. Thus it may be that we have a chronological sequence issue with the story of Naaman, the Syrian army commander who was afflicted with Zerat and cleansed of it by immersing in the Jordan River. Because as a result, of Gehazi dishonestly trying to extract money from Naaman in Elisha's name, he contracted the Zerat. Of course, we don't know exactly when the Zerat appeared on his body or where on his body it might have broken out. So perhaps he could hide it with clothing and care not one whit about bringing his ritual uncleanness into the king's palace. But it could be that the story of Naaman actually occurred after this seven-year famine. So it's all a little bit of a mystery. Well, verse 4 has the king asking Gehazi to tell him about the several miracles that his master had performed when the subject of one of them, this woman, appears. But then she goes on to explain her current difficulty. The king is immediately receptive to her plight. He orders that her property is to be returned to her. And further, she is to be compensated for whatever produce had been grown and harvested in her fields during her absence. Now, there's a couple of things to notice about this. 
One is that we need not think of biblical famines as a complete absence of food, but rather due to weather or pestilence or, or war, the crops were greatly reduced. This forced food shortages, which caused the prices for what little there was to rise substantially. And of course, this would disproportionately affect the poor of society. For them, it could literally mean starvation, but for the wealthy, it was more about inconvenience in that they might not be able to get some of their favorite foods or that they had to pay more of their disposable income for staples. The second thing to notice is that the woman was to be compensated for the food that had been grown on her land by those squatters during her absence. See, here's why. Technically, no one in Israel owned land. Everyone who possessed land was leaseholders, not landowners. God owned the land. It was a critical principle. Therefore, what the Israelites possessed was the use of the land, meaning whatever it produced. So the value of the land was not in the soil itself. It was in what could be grown on it. And this principle flows throughout the Bible, Old and New Testaments. It's reflected in a number of ways, but primarily in the laws concerning the kinsman redeemer, whose job, primary job, it was to rescue the use of the land from being transferred into another clan or tribe or worst case into foreign hands. And the price that a kinsman redeemer paid was always based on the value of the crops produced on that land. The connection between this story and the one in chapter 7 about the siege in Samaria is this. In the final moments of that siege, when the Lord rescued his people by throwing a supernatural terror into the Syrian army so that it fled, the king of Israel's servant who scoffed at Elisha's prediction that God would provide so much food in but hours that food prices would fall back to normal rates, well, he was killed in the stampede of all these starving people to get to that food that had been left behind in the Syrian war camp. Thus, the man who had blasphemed the Lord in disbelief was destroyed by his lack of faith. But here in chapter 8, the Shunammite woman not only escaped the horrible effects of famine by being delivered from it, but she also had her land and wealth rescued by the Lord and restored to her due to her steadfast obedience to the word of God, her trust in the God of Israel, her allegiance to Elisha, God's supreme prophet and earthly representative. Thus, in the first few verses of chapter 8, the writer gives us a glaring contrast between the catastrophic results of faithlessness versus the victorious deliverance by means of the righteous exercise of faithfulness by the people of God when our usual and our needed sources of life and sustenance suddenly just disappear. Let's move on to our next story that begins in verse 7. Now I find this story as mysterious as it is fascinating. Elisha goes to Damascus, Syria to anoint a fellow named Hazael as the new king of Syria, Aram. Now, Hazael is, of course, an Aramean. He's not a Hebrew. The question for me is not so much why Elisha went to Damascus, but rather why any Syrian would be at all interested in having the Israelite Elisha anoint one of them to be their king. Would Israel accept having some Syrian prophet of a Syrian god come down to Israel to declare who'd be the next king of Israel? He'd be laughed out of town for good reason. As for the easy part, why he went, it was to fulfill a mission 
that the Lord had actually given to Elisha's former master, Elial, Elijah, but he was never able to carry it out. Elijah had not remained on earth long enough for political conditions in Aram to play out to the point that it was time for this anointing of Hazael. But now the time had come. And so God sent Elisha to do it in Elijah's stead. Let's reread that section of 1 Kings. 1 Kings, where Elijah was commissioned to go and anoint this Hazael as the next king, as the next uh, Syrian king. Turn to 1 Kings 19. 1 Kings 19. We're going to read verses 11 through 18. 1 Kings 19, we're going to read verses 11 through 18. He said, Go outside and stand on the mountain before Adonai. And right there and then Adonai went past. A mighty blast of wind tore the mountains apart. It broke the rocks into pieces before Adonai. But Adonai was not in the wind. And after the wind came an earthquake, but Adonai was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, fire broke out, but Adonai was not in the fire. And after the fire came a quiet, subdued voice. And when Elijah heard it, he covered his face with his cloak, and he stepped out and stood at the entrance to the cave. And then a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Eliel? And he answered, I have been very zealous for Adonai, the God of armies, because the people of Israel have abandoned your covenant, broken down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. Now I'm the only one left, and they're after me to kill me too. And Adonai said to him, Go back by the way of the Damascus desert. And when you get there, anoint Hazael to be king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, to be king over Israel, and anoint Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Avel Mechulah, to be a prophet after you. Jehu will kill whoever escapes the sword of Hazael. Elisha will kill whoever escapes the sword of Jehu. Still, I will spare 7,000 in Israel, every knee that hasn't bent down before Baal, every mouth that has not kissed him. <clears throat> Elisha knew before he went that he was going to anoint a man as the new king of Aram who would become a cruel tormentor of Israel. I'm not sure that we can fully identify with what kind of emotional pain and anxiety this must have caused Elisha to essentially have a direct hand in helping a Gentile to become a bloodthirsty oppressor of his own people. Alfred Edersham, that astute 19th century Christian Jewish scholar who could be rightly considered the godfather of the Hebrew Roots Movement, says this about Elisha's frightening assignment. He says, although there is not any express statement to that effect, we cannot help but connect the journey of Elisha to Damascus with the commission formerly given to Elijah to anoint Hazael king over Syria. This may help us to understand that the word of God has a wider than the barely literal application which so often tends to perplex the superficial reader. It also shows that its fulfillment may be delayed. And when finally made, it comes in a different manner than expected. And lastly, that the prophets may have for many years borne this painful secret of some terrible trouble to come, forbearing to take any part till the movement for action arrived, or rather, for their obedience that was indicated to them from above. Elisha knew this day was coming. What a terrible burden he bore. He would be obedient to the Lord to do something that could almost seem like treason to most any citizen of Israel. And he would do it 
without really understanding God's mind on this matter. However, we don't hear of him asking the question that seems to be regularly on the tip of the tongue of most churchgoers in our age. Why? Why, God? Why? Why, God, do you want to energize and authorize a killer to come and kill your own people? That is a great trust and obedience that's at work. When we act in faith and we don't question, we don't try to judge the motives of the Lord. When the reasons for his actions seem incomprehensible to us. But the real mystery to me is why Azael would pay any attention whatsoever to an old Israelite prophet who represented a God that Hazel certainly didn't worship. And why would he think it's appropriate for a Hebrew to come uninvited to anoint a new king of a foreign nation? And as usual, when we focus on why we tend to head down rabbit trails into allegory and speculation. See, rather the issue for us ought to be which. Which God pattern is being acted out here? And what we find is that over and over again, the Lord uses Gentiles to punish his people when his people have become too unfaithful and rebellious. Even the great conqueror Nebuchadnezzar was anointed. He was set into motion by God to punish Israel. It's only that in time, Nebuchadnezzar became too, too cruel to the Jews. He overdid it in God's eyes, so God acted to punish Babylon. Open your Bibles to Jeremiah 27. Jeremiah 27. We're going to read verses 1 through 10. 593 if you have a complete Jewish Bible. Jeremiah. Chapter 27. <clears throat> At the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of uh, Yoshiao, the king of Judah, the word came to Jeremiah from Adonai. Adonai says this to me. Make yourself a yoke of straps <clears throat> and crossbars and put it on your neck. Send similar yokes to the kings of Edom, of Moab, of the people of Ammon, of Zor, and of Sidon by means of the envoys that they send to Jerusalem and to uh, Zedekiah, king of Judah. Give them this message for their masters by telling their envoys that Adonai Sevaot, the king of Israel, says for them to tell their masters, I made the earth, humankind, the animals on the earth, by my great power, my outstretched arm. I gave it to whom it seems right to me. For now, I have given over all these lands to my servant, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babel. I have also given to him the wild animals to serve him. All the nations will serve him, his son and his grandson, until his own country gets its turn at which times many nations and great kings will make him their slave. The nation and the kingdom that refuses to serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babel, that will not put their necks under the yoke of the king of Babel, I will punish, says Adonai, with sword, famine, and plague until I have put an end to them through him. The other thing that we know historically is that Israel and Syria, especially Damascus, had an interesting and a long-term relationship, an on-again, off-again relationship that in our time is certainly off again. And it seems that while the governments of Israel and Syria had a strange love-hate relationship over the centuries, 
that regularly broke out into open hostilities, there must have been some underlying close-knit relationship between the common citizens of Israel and the common citizens of Damascus. I suspect there had been a great deal of intermarriage and migration between these two kingdoms. And so there were very likely close family ties. In fact, we know that at one point, around 150 years before Christ was born, that the high priest Zadok was deposed by the Jewish Hasmonean dynasty. And he chose to go into self-imposed exile in Damascus. There he was the founder of a large colony of Levites who obviously lived in harmony with the Syrian people and even the writers of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Essens of Qumran, had a large and thriving colony in Damascus. Well, in verses 7 and 8, we also learn that the, when the current king of Aram, Ben-Hadad, heard that Elisha was coming, he told Hazael to go and meet with him and bring some gifts and inquire if the king would live or die. It seems that Ben-Hadad was seriously ill and it was common for a sick or an injured person to seek a prophet or a, a seer to find out how this would all turn out. People of all ages have always wanted to know the future. And Elisha's gift of second sight was known far and wide. Now, I'm not sure I can think of a person in the Bible who had been given more of a gift of knowing the future and knowing what others were thinking than Elisha. Now, Hazael must have been a top aide to the king of Syria, perhaps Ben-Hadad's military commander. They, they were usually the second in command over a nation. Hazael did as the king asked, and we're told he took gifts that represented the best that Damascus had to offer, and it required 40 camels to carry it all. However, you should know that while the gift being brought to Elisha was no doubt rich, it's not like the 40 camels were heavily loaded. Okay. Rather, in that era, the pomp and circumstance of presenting a gift was as important as the gift itself. So a large procession of camels and camel drivers and musicians and splendidly dressed dignitaries accompanied whatever the gift might be in order to make a big impression. See, it was not unusual that a camel might carry only a single modestly sized object. So it's not like a fortune was carried to Elisha. In fact, much of it was probably things like the local wine, local produce, some dates, some cloth, maybe a few gold or silver objects. It was more about a required Middle Eastern show of honor and respect. Verse 9 says that upon greeting Elisha, Hazael got right to the point and he asked if his king would recover from his sickbed or not. But the way he asked is something we need to discuss. He said to Elisha, your son, Ben-Hadad of Aram, has sent me. It's the matter of the use of the term, your son, that I want to expound upon. Now first, obviously, Ben-Hadad was not Elisha's son, nor were they in any way related. But second, this is usually said by Bible commentators to merely be a customary sign of respect or a standard, standard Middle Eastern greeting. And while there's some truth to that, it also carries another more subtle but much more powerful sense to it. <clears throat> Now, while affection was certainly part and parcel of a father-son relationship in the ancient Middle East, that is secondary to the working part of the relationship. Rather, such a relationship has established a clear pecking order. The father was senior and therefore the senior authority in the family. The son was junior and therefore subject to his father's authority. 
Such an authority was then and it remains so to this day an extremely serious and basic element of Middle Eastern societies. A son who refused to be subject to his father brought shame to the family. And such a thing was intolerable and often remedied by either the son leaving the area or by his being killed by another family member since shame tended to extend to the entire clan. Thus, then as now, when an Arab says that you are a son to him, that might sound like you've just made a dear friend. But it carries a much different implication to his mind. Because as a son, you are obligated <coughs> to honor him as a father. Which means that while, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> while you have indeed established a cordial and a friendly relationship, he has just placed himself in a position of authority over you. And you have therefore become subject to him. So this is entirely different than what a Middle Easterner of ancient or modern times speaks of a person as a brother to him. A brother is an equal. It's a true offer of a close friendship with no issues of authority attached to it. Now here, no doubt, <coughs> Elisha was the older man and the king of Aram was truly offering that he would show Elisha the honor and respect of a father. This was no trivial thing. And I suspect that Hazael saw it as a great insult to the Syrian people that their king would bow down, would offer submission to some tattered old Israelite prophet whose people he was currently at war with. But it also expressed Ben-Hadad's current weakness and his vulnerability. And as we're soon going to see for Hazael, that was like washing the blood off of a wound in a pool of piranhas. Elisha answered Hazael's question about the king's health in a way that has caused great difficulties, both in intent and in translation. The typical rendering in English is that Elisha told him to go back and to tell King Ben-Hadad he was going to recover, but in fact, he would not recover. And this, that this is what God actually specifically told him to do. Now, as you can imagine, this has caused a lot of heartburn among Jewish and Christian scholars. As here we have Yehovah essentially instructing Elisha to tell a lie to a deathly ill man, who, by the way, was honoring God's prophet, giving full respect to Israel's God. This has nothing to do with deceiving an enemy in order to win a battle. So what do we have here? The words, you shall, shall certainly recover, are in Hebrew, vayomer alei ve'elesha lechamor lo chaya. Those who know a little bit of Hebrew ought to have heard something a bit suspicious among those Hebrew words. You heard the word lo. Lo means no or not. So when we translate these words literally, it says you shall certainly not live, even though our English Bibles leave out the word not. But then it seems strange to say in addition to you will not live, however you will certainly die. Doesn't make a lot of sense. Now while there's no academic consensus of what to do with this oddly constructed sentence, in my opinion, the meaning is quite transparent once we find out what actually happened in the end. <clears throat> you see, the meaning of this is, <clears throat> you will not die of your illness which is what the king directly asked Elisha. 
However, Elisha volunteered that you will surely die. Meaning you won't, die, you will die. It's just not going to be from your illness. And we're going to see in a couple of verses that the king indeed did not die of his illness as he was fearing. Rather, he was unexpectedly murdered as he lay in bed, helplessly weakened by his illness. So Elisha nailed it. He told the truth just as the Lord had told him to say it. In fact, Elisha's words absolutely stunned Hazael, who was already considering murder in his heart. But what with the shame and the dishonor that Ben-Hadad had heaped upon the Syrian people by calling himself a son before his Hebrew father, Elisha, it's cemented in his heart to go ahead with the assassination. We'll pick up this fascinating narrative next time. Father God, I want to thank you for this word of yours. Oh, Father, when we take the time, there is so much depth in every word. Oh, Father, help us to untangle the many things that we may have been taught over our lives that block us from seeing the, the truth that is just there in your word for all of your people to discover. Lord, we love you with all of our hearts. We thank you that you saw fit to inspire men, humans, just normal people, Father, to take your word and write it down and keep it faithful for century after century after century that we can have it today. That we can know who you are, not just by experience, but by what we read about you and learn of you and all of your wonderful acts and deeds in your word. We thank you, Father, for making us able, for enabling us of all of your creatures to have a Holy Spirit within us. That we can even know that there is God. That there is such a thing as an eternity. That there is heaven, but also there is hell. And we thank you for Yeshua, who has opened the gates of heaven for us and closed the gates of hell. Blessed be your holy name. Amen. Amen.